All right, so we are doing the uh, two degree of freedom, which basically is this type of equation. And we have seen that following the procedure, basically it means doing the free body diagram, writing down the kinetic equation. You can derive the equation of motion, all right? And we went through the whole solutions, first solving for the eigenvalues, then solving for the mole shapes. That is for the free vibration. But when we had the force vibration, so we did a problem here showing the mole shapes. Then we went, MATLAB code. Okay, that one we haven't done it. We might do it another time. We did the force vibration, all right? But here I didn't go in detail because the division is the same as before. We look at the solution. We use the impedance notation with the Zs. We can also solve this with the Laplace transform if we want, but I mean, we cannot do everything. And we look at the solution for this type of problem. Okay, but most important after that, we went and look at what happens over here for a real case. So we say that over here you have the two resonance because you have two uh, degree of freedom, one here and one here. Okay, and then you can see that over here you have the, the, the displacement of x1 will be zero right over here. Okay. And that here will be minimum. So you see there's a location where basically the deformation of the two masses looks like it's gonna be minimum. No? So we said that probably what we can do with this, if we have two masses and two springs, and let's say maybe two dampers and not two dampers, we can create some type of uh, isolation system, no? Or, or try to make sure that a machine that operates, let's say, at a frequency over here, these two peaks are not like too close to it, all right? So we can move them apart, okay? So that's basically the goal of today's class. And first, the first thing we're gonna do is like here, we're gonna see how can we select the mass or the, or the stiffness in order to go away from the resonance frequency on the isolation, on the isolator, sorry. All right, so let's do that and there we go. So here would be the first one we're gonna do is undamp. Vibration isolator. Okay, so I'm gonna do the figure here. Let's say we have a mass. M2 that will be connected. To a mass M1. By spring K2. And this one will be connected to the ground. by spring K1. Okay, so we're gonna select here our coordinate system, which is the relative coordinate system, so X1 and X2. So each one will have a coordinate system, each one of these masses. And let's say over here that M1, is subjected to a force F1 cosine capital omega t. Okay, so what is the real, if you want, meaning of this figure? What could be a direct application? So imagine that you don't have M2, okay? So let's say this is your piece of equipment that you have in a machine shop that is operating at a certain frequency, okay? But, <laughs> The bad thing is that the natural frequency, let's say capital omega, is too close to the natural frequency of the system M and K. So what's gonna happen? That machinery is gonna be operating almost at the resonance frequency. So it's gonna be a lot of vibration, no? A lot of vibration is gonna end up with a lot of usage and damage and so on. So what would be a solution maybe to try to 
shift the frequency not of the machine because you cannot change it which is a capital omega but the natural frequency of the system you can add let's say a mass and a spread no okay and that way you can make sure that you move away from the resonance frequency so you want over here will be how do you select m and k2 in order to move away from the resonance frequency okay so that is the idea over here all right so since we have time let's just go through the whole procedure again okay so first thing in order to find the equation of motion for this system will be to do a free body diagram so first thing let's say free body diagram really should not be called free body because it's moving it should be called like dynamic body diagram but it doesn't matter it's a figure okay so if we look at m1 and m2 we're gonna have let's say m1 here have m1 here and then we're gonna have uh, let's say maybe i should have done it yeah, it doesn't matter it's too late let's do it this way doesn't matter okay so maybe i'm going to start from m2 i think i did it a bit easier so let's say what will be in here and up to you will have so we're going to neglect the weights all right so this will be what k2 times what we already done about that x2 minus x1 no the relative displacement and then this will be moving m2 uh, yeah m2 x double dot two will be ma So now M1, you should have here the opposite, same direction. So you will have here the K2, X2 minus X1. But now you also have a spring at the bottom. So you will have here K1, X1. And here, let's not forget that we're also going to have the force. So let me put it over here. F1 for sine omega t. Okay, and I think I forgot in M1, what will you have here? M1 x double dot one. Okay, so now step two is what? To use what type of motion is this having? Translation, no? Okay, and just note again that here I'm saying we are neglecting. So uh, here we neglect. basically uh, the weight, so the great weight. Okay. All right, so step two is what? We, the, we see that the motion is solid translation, so that means that the kinetic equation defining the motion will be just summation of forces equal to MA. So step two will be use the kinetic equation or dynamic equation. Since it's only translation, we can do summation of forces equals to MA. So let's first do the mass M1. Basically, what do we need? We need to have the figure, no? Remember, all the equations come from a figure. They don't come. So we're going to have summation of forces. I mean, it just be right here. Summation of forces equal to M1A. So let's start by M1. 
So we look at that figure, what are we gonna have? Minus K X1 plus K2 X2 minus X1. What else do we have? Plus F1 cosine capital omega T equal to M1 X double dot one. So if I rearrange this, okay, let's see, we're gonna have M1 X double dot one. Then, so we're gonna move it. So here, what do we have? Minus K, what would that be? K1, sorry, K1 X1 minus K2 X1, no? We move them to the other side, so we could write this as plus K1 plus K2 X1. Then we have plus K2 X2, we move to the other side, will be minus K2 X2, and we leave this F1 to the same side. So this would be equal to F1 sine capital omega T. Okay, so this will be the equation of motion for the first mass. We do the same thing for the second mass. So we look at this over here. Let's see, summation of forces equal to and to A. Will give us what? So we need to look at the figure. That will just give us minus K2 x2 minus x1 equal to m2 x double dot 2. So we just rearrange. This is going to give us m2 x double dot 2. Now we're going to move that one to this side. So we have the plus kx1. So we be minus k2 x1 plus k2 x2 equal to zero. So basically the two equations that we have over here are over here. Okay, so so now if we just take the two equations and we write them into matrix form, what do we have? We're going to come up with a classic form M one zero zero M two. X double dot one, X double dot two. Okay, hey, do you remember how to go from here to here, no? All right, so now we only have the spring. So remember, because we use the Relative coordinate system, we kind of talk about it. The coupling will be within the stiffness and not the masses. So remember, here should always be K1. I mean, here's K1 plus K2 minus K2 minus K2 and K2. And here we have X1 
X2. And here we're going to have F1 cosine capital omega T and zero. I mean, by now the procedure should be pretty clear, no? Okay, so this is the equation of motion. Of undamped isolator. Okay, so now that we have the equation of motion, what do we need to do? We need to find the solution. Yeah? What is the first step on the solution? We need to assume the solution, not the form of the solution. So we say, assume solution. So over here, since this is a force frequency, the assumed solution is to be in function of the force frequency, no? So I assume solution will be, so it should be x1, x2. I'm gonna put like a vector since it's gonna be x1, x2. Will be equal to the capital X, one and two, EI, and is capital omega T, which is the force frequency. Okay, so since we have some space over here before I go and substitute, maybe let's just look at the mean of this. So this means that X1 equal to capital X1 EI omega T, the two equal to capital X2 EI omega T. And then what would be the force? So let's say our force, Let me add something here. So at least we can have it consistent. The I capital omega T. So it will mean that what we have F1, it's F2 is zero. We'd be equal to F1, just taking the real part of the I capital omega T. Why am I just taking the real part? Because it's the cosine, no? Yeah, all right. Okay, so next, what do we do? I mean, I didn't have to write under this form, but just to use this space. Now we need to substitute this into the equation of motion. Substituting. Into. Equation of motion, we always get kind of the same thing. If we can take here the real part of E I omega T. And here we have the minus M1 capital omega plus K1 plus K2. Here we should have minus K2. And here we should have minus M2 capital omega plus K2 of X1 
That's two equal to F one zero. And here should be again the real part of E I capital omega T. And here should be minus K two again. Okay, so what is the reason why we assume the solution in function of the first frequency? So that at this step you could do this. So now, remember, you still be rewriting this all the time, or using impedance notation, which basically is that Z. We had that we call this being equal to Z R S. Of omega, you don't have to really put the omega, but let's say we put it of of vector x that will be x one, x two, should be equal to the vector force. So since we have time here, and from here we say that in order to solve for x, we could say what x vector x will be equal to the ZRS inverse times the force F. Okay, so in this problem, you see, I mean, we had the uh, general expression, but here you will see that Z11 should be equal to what? Just come over here, it should be equal to minus M1 capital omega squared plus K1 plus K2. Z12 equals Z21 equal to minus K2. And Z22 will be minus M2 capital omega squared plus K sub two. Okay, and F over here. Maybe it should just be equal to F1. So no mysteries, okay. So this should be equal to F1, zero, to be accurate. Okay, so we did that last class. What is the, since this is a two by two, what should be the inverse of this matrix? So let's do it again. In this problem here, Z, R, S minus one. Basically, should be equal to what? Should be equal to the determinant of this, which will be minus M1 capital omega squared plus K1 plus K2. Maybe I should just use the impedance notation where I've been faster, too late, minus M2 capital omega squared plus K2. Minus, so it should be Minus, yeah, this becomes pretty minus K2 square. And now we're here, you're gonna have minus, you inverse this one, so it should be minus M2 capital omega square plus M2. You switch the sign. 
I'm not gonna ask this for this one. Um, minus M1 capital Omega plus K1 plus K2. I mean, this is basically, I'm just gonna kind of try to redo it quick, but when we look at all this derivation here, all right, remember we have this. Okay, for this example, we use the response would be F1, Z2, 2, Z11. You could come and use these expressions, no? Okay, but I've kind of redoing it. So this looks like the problem, but you see over here, this one, this expression, this is the inverse, is basically what I've done here, no? But I replace it by the values of the Z11, Z22. Okay, this is the impedance. Basically, I'm just using what we did on the class notes, but I'm expanding it a little bit instead of just coming here, all right? So for us, basically, we should come to this equation. What would be F2 for us? Zero, no? Okay, so you could come to this equation and substitute with the Z22 and so on. That's basically what I'm doing. So for this problem, now this is gonna give us that X1, which will be in function of the F1. So it should be equal to F1 minus M2 capital omega squared plus K2. Uh, divided of all this term over here. So here we go. Minus M1 capital omega plus K1 plus K2 times minus M2 capital omega square plus K2 minus K2 square. And X2. will be equal to K2 F1 at on the denominator will be the same term. Okay, so I'll give you some time copy this let me pause it I will you have to wait if you watch it all right so now in order to follow the textbook notation we need to kind of not change the variable but just use a slit this equation into a slightly different form okay Okay, so using notation, and there's a reason to do it because then for the figure makes it um, better understanding. So this one, I have the equations. So the natural frequency of the system, if we go again, what is our original system here? Our original system would just be to have M1 and K1, no? Okay, M1 and K1, so the natural, frequency of our original system should be K1 divided by M1. And that would be the natural frequency of, let's say of our machine. So of main, system. Now, the reason why we have N2, K2 is because this will be our isolator, no? That we're gonna use in order to control where, where's gonna be the natural frequency of the whole system, okay? Because originally what's happening is that we only have this, the natural frequency of this one is too close to the natural frequency of the machine. So this will be operating 
over in resonance, and we don't want that. So what I'm trying to do is to move the natural frequency of this system. Okay, so now our whole system will be both of them combined. But we can just say that the mass M2 will be the absorber. So let's say little omega sub A will be K2. over M2, and this will be the natural frequency of absorber if it was alone, okay? Okay, so we're also gonna introduce X static will be equal to the static deformation of the main system that should be equal to what? So what is the force of the spring? F equal Kx, no? So the static deformation will be force divided by K1. And this will be static deformation of main system. And finally, the survival called mu, which is just the ratio of the masses. Okay, so with this new notation, we're going to rewrite X1 and X2, okay? So let me use the green one, works pretty good. So X1, will be equal to what? So this one is pretty long. I mean, it's not the, is the denominator. So let me start by the denominator. So basically all this term over here, over the denominator, all right, will become what? One plus mu Omega sub A over Omega sub N square minus capital Omega over Omega N square times one minus capital Omega over Omega sub A square minus mu Omega sub A over Omega sub N square. And on top here, we're gonna have one minus capital Omega over the frequency of the absorber square times X static. And X2 so denominator is exactly the same thing. You can just copy it. All right, and the top is very simple. It's just the static deflection. Thank you. 
Okay. So now again, I mean, uh, basically we go back to what we did the other day. Which I think it's this one here. What is that figure that we did? I guess it should be at the end. The figure I showed before. Remember from this figure that what do we say? There is a frequency for which a ratio of the frequency omega over omega sub one, that this will be equal to zero, no? Okay? And then for this one, this one should look like X2 will be minimum. All right? Okay? So that's basically exactly what we're, gonna, what we're doing. Let's call it here. So just so I don't have to put numbers, let's call this one star and this one double star. So I can just say here from equation star, okay? We already saw in the general case, you can find a value for which X1 will be equal to zero. Okay? So, when would this be equal to zero? When this term over here, this term over here is equal to zero, no? Okay? So, that means when one minus capital omega over omega the absorber equal uh, square equal to zero. So if we solve this, this is gonna give that when this is equal to zero, no? So basically that means this is gonna happen when the natural frequency of the absorber is equal to the frequency, is equal to the force frequency. Okay, so this ratio is one minus one. I need to call that one little i. Okay, so now how can we find X2? The only thing we need to do is substitute this omega sub A by the capital omega, no? Yeah, and solve. So, so now in order to find the deformation X2, we need to substitute this omega sub A for the absorber. We substitute it by the force frequency capital omega into this equation, okay? So we do that. So next. to determine X2. A comma, uh, equation Roman one is substituted into equation double star, which is basically the equation for X2, okay? So I think I have the solution for that. Maybe does some, something's gonna cancel, let's see. Uh, so this term over here will cancel, no? Oh, sorry, the bottom, it means the same one. This one will cancel, no? So we are just left with this one and this one over here. Okay, so it's not complicated algebra. So basically we have, what uh, is in the green? No, the black for this one, so. X2, we say would just be, the X 
static divided by the mu omega sub a over omega sub n square. And actually we had a minus sign over here. So I'm just gonna put it in here, okay? On top, it doesn't matter, All right? Okay, so let's now let's go back and try to simplify this. I mean, you could leave it this way, but all right. If we go back to the substitution, that's why I'm not a big fan of this substitution, but yeah, we follow the textbook. So this is F1 over K1. So minus F1 over K1. Now, Mu is M2 over M1. And now these ones are square. Okay, so we can remove the square root. So the third one should be the one of the absorber is K2 divided by M2. And the bottom one is K1. divided by M1. Okay, so if we start simplifying, this is just, you don't have to do this, but it's good for the understanding. You see that this M2 will cancel with this one, this M1 will cancel with this one, and then this K1 will cancel with this one. So at the end, we are just left with x2 equal to minus f1 over k2. Okay, so basically, what I'm trying to say is what? Is that if we go back to the initial figure, now really the total deformation of this will be equal to what? To the new spring now, divided by the force F1. So let's say that you have your machine that, I'm just thinking, okay, allowed. Let's say you have a problem that is within whatever, a closet, no? And maybe the clearance of the closet at the, at the top might be, let's say, might be just a few inches, okay? So you need to make sure that now your system is not gonna go above that deformation of X2, no? Okay, so how do you determine that? So one, for you, you need to make sure that this deformation here, so that the K2 is high enough, that is not gonna hit the top of the closet where you have your machine, no? Okay, so for example, one point could be, determine the spring value and the mass value so that the deformation does not exceed, let's say two inches, no? That could be one problem, okay? And you should come over here, all right. So. All right, so in this case, so the solution, of the isolator system would be what? What would be X1? The little X1. What was the assumed solution? Capital X1, EI, omega T, no? But this time, what is X1? Zero. So ideally, X1 should be zero. X2 should be equal to what? X2 now? Yeah? And then, I mean, I'm gonna put EI omega T to make it like similar, but now we know X2 is equal to what? Minus F1 over K2. 
And really, what did we add here at the first frequency? We only had to take the real part, no? So this is really cosine omega t. Did you see why this EI becomes just cosine? It's just because the first frequency is cosine, no? It's not a sign. All right. Okay, so now, so here, let's say the force in absorber, again, this is to use the textbook notation. So what is the, the absorber? So let's go back to the figure, is the one of M2, no? So it should be M3 here if you want. So the absorber is M2. And if you look at the figure, this had a force over here, K2, X2 minus X1. Let's say this would be the force of the absorber, no? Yeah? Just rewriting this one, okay? So since X1, X1 would be what? Zero, the force of the absorber will be equal to, really this is negative, it's going down. Be, we just look at the amplitude, it doesn't matter. K2, X2. So now if I substitute X2, what are you gonna have? So it should be equal to K2 times minus F1 over K2 cosine omega t. So really the force of the absorber, I mean, all this stuff makes sense. It just be equal to minus F1 cosine omega t. So let me finish and then answer the question. So basically we go back to the system. I mean, you will see that all this stuff makes sense, no? But what is the value of the force applied? F1 cosine omega t, yeah? What is the force created by this mass M2? Minus F1 cosine omega t. So basically what we're doing is what? We are setting up M2 and K2 in such a way that it's exactly equal to this force, but basically on the opposite direction. Yeah? Okay. So basically we're set up M2, M2, so that this becomes zero. F1 cosine omega t, F1 cosine omega t. All right. Okay, guys, so I forgot to put the recording. Basically, we're doing the exercise. So I don't know if I was recording when you had the problem statement. So basically, let's read quick again the problem statement. We have a diesel engine weighing 3,000 newtons. There is support on a pedestal. So that would be K1 and M1. It is observed that the engine induces vibration into the surrounding area through a pedestal mount at a speed of 6,000 RPM. So 6,000 RPM will be the you want here the F1, uh, whatever, E, I, omega T, no? Would be the capital omega, all right? And they say to determine M2 and, A2, uh, M2 and K2, knowing that the amplitude of the force is 250 newtons, 
and that X2, the deformation, should not exceed two millimeters. Okay? So basically, we know here, F1 here is. Two hundred fifty newtons. So that's interesting. Let's solve it in a different way. Okay, the problem. I hope he's gonna get the same thing. Because now we need to solve for K two, no? So we could solve just from K two over here. All right. So here solving. For K2, this will give us that we're just going to look at the magnitude. So you can have an air spring. K2 should be equal to F1 divided by X2. So this will be what? One, not 250, sorry. Sorry for that. This is a 250 at the top divided by 0 0.002. So that's very easy to solve. It's basically 250 divided by two, no? So 125, and then this is divided by 1000, so it becomes uh, 10 to the three. So this should be kilonewtons per meter. Okay, this is 125, 10 to the three, no? 250 divided by two, and this is one divided by 1000, so it goes on top. So now this is pretty simple now to observe. So what do we say? The frequency of the absorber should be equal to what? K2 over M2. The root if you want. Okay, so in our problem, when we did the assumption, what do we say about the frequency? Let's see what that is. In order to be zero, what needs to happen? Capital omega needed to be equal to the frequency of the absorber, no? Yeah. So in this case, remember that this is the capital omega, really. All right. So here you know that. In order to have, this is in order to have X1 equal to zero, you need to have that the frequency of the absorber is equal to this. So from here, we can just write that omega square equal to the capital omega square will be equal to K2 over M2. So we solve for the mass will be equal to what? K2 divided by the frequency. And the answer of that is 0 0.31663 kilograms. I mean, obviously here, because of the of the time constraint, I went a bit fast, but I think this is because of the zoom before. Let's see if I can zoom out a little bit. Okay, so here I went a little bit uh, quick again because of the time constraint, but if you have this problem, I would like you to develop a little bit the solution, no? Okay. 
So I don't want you to do the whole thing we did for an hour, but kind of show me that you understand what's happening. 